Not all these questions will need you to do that, but if it does, it's going to ask you to break down a radical for some of these questions. And that's actually what I have here at the top. Did you guys learn how to do this with like a factor tree? Is that how you, how did we learn how to break down a radical? Would you how did you learn how to do it? Yeah, a factor tree. Did anybody else learn it in a different way? Did you guys learn it to do it with the biggest perfect square? Everyone's looking at me like I'm crazy. That's how you got okay. Let me let me show you this, please, because as much as I love a factor tree, I think it takes a long time to do it, and I think this is much faster. If you like the factor tree, please feel free to use the factor tree. But please also just give me one second to ask you this question. So none of these are perfect squares. Can anybody tell me the biggest perfect square? So like on the list, here's the perfect square, and the square root is next to it. Uh, but they just go in order. What what is the biggest perfect square that would divide into 80? Does anybody know? 4 goes into 80. Okay, let me show you something. So if you're trying to check it, like if you do 80 divided by 4, if the result is also divisible by a perfect square, there's a bigger perfect square that will go into it. So there's a little bit bigger number. Rudy, do you know what it is? 16. Okay, this is how I learned how to break down a radical. And you grab your calculator, just start dividing by numbers on this list. All right, so 80 is the same thing as, it has to be multiplication, it can't be addition or subtraction, it has to be multiplication. It's the same thing as 16 times 5. If you do 16 times 5, I promise you it's 80. What is the square root of 16? All right, so take the 4 out in front. Leave the 5 under the square root. That's your answer. Might just save you a little bit of time if you can figure out the biggest perfect square that will divide into the number because then you can just take the square root of the perfect square and leave the rest under the radical sign. Anybody know biggest perfect square that will go into 72? It's 36, yeah. So 36 times 2. And then you guys know, what's the square root of 36? 6. All right, so the 6 comes out in front, the 2 stays underneath. It might just save you a little bit of time, just taking the square root of the perfect square. This one's tricky. Anybody know biggest perfect square that will go into 98? 49. Yeah, 49 times 2. All right, so then I just take square root of 49 comes out in front, that's 7, and the 2 stays under the square root. Anybody know biggest perfect square that would go into 150? Oh, Ethan, go ahead, sorry. 25, yes. Uh, let's see, 25 times 6. All right, take your square root there. So a 5 goes out in front, and 6 stays underneath. And I just have one more. What's the biggest perfect square that would go into 300? Rudy, what do you think? 100. And it has to be 100 times something. So 100 times 3 can't be adding or subtracting. Take the square root of 100, so that's 10. That goes out in front. This 3 stays under the radical. We got simplest radical form. Some of the questions today, most of the questions are going to ask you to leave your answers in this format. There's a couple word problems where we're going to, if we have a square root that's not a nice perfect square, we're going to use the calculator to solve that, just in a couple questions. Okay, so when would we use a square root to solve a quadratic equation? Really, there's two scenarios. Go ahead. No linear, no linear term. For sure. All right. So I'm going to say no. I'm just going to put this in quotation marks. Um, B times X term, which is your linear term. Okay. That's mainly, like if you were to look this up in a book or something, that's what it would tell you. Don't When you don't have a linear term, because you're just going to have an x squared in the equation. You're not going to have another term with an x, so you can get the x squared alone. Okay, now, I'm going to, I don't really know a good way to describe this, so I'm just going to make up a little problem that would be another scenario. All right, so let's say we had something like, I'm just making this up, in parentheses, 2x plus 5 squared and it was equal to any, it literally, wait, I could do any number. Um, let me just do um, 35 or something. It doesn't matter. And equal to anything. Okay, now in terms of this, 
if you had this problem, I would not want you to FOIL, but if you did FOIL, you would get a quadratic because you'd have 2x times 2x, which would create 4x squared. This is the other scenario where you can use a square root. So square root and a squared are inverse operations. They cancel each other out. So if you had a set of parentheses, which technically the way this is written, this has a linear term. 2x would be a linear term here. But if you have this, don't FOIL because you could just right there take the square root and the square root and squared cancel out so you would just drop the parentheses there. So that's the other scenario. So I've got kind of two, the first example is going to go with that first scenario, no linear term. And the second example I've got, you're going to see some parentheses, but we don't want to FOIL because we can actually, if you see a set of parentheses squared, you're like, yes, that's awesome because you can get that by itself and then just take the square root. So those are the two scenarios where this is the best way to solve the quadratic equation. Okay, so who can help me? The very first problem, I got 3x squared plus 2 equals 23. How would you, how would you solve that equation? Like, what would you do first? Jonathan, go ahead. Okay. So I got 3x squared equals 21. Then what do you want to do? Okay. So then we got x squared equals 7. And then what do you want to do? then what would you write next? Okay, now I'm going to add one tiny thing to that. Yes. Okay, you introduced the square root into the problem. There was no square root in the original problem. I saw no radical there. But if you introduce the square root to solve the problem, what you have to do is you have to put this plus and minus symbol in front of it because it actually has two answers. If you have x squared, as your highest power of x, your equation should have two answers. If we were to look at it on the graph, this would not be a nice number because it's the square root of 7. But what that symbol means is the positive square root of 7 or the negative square root of 7. Those are both answers. It's just a little shortcut, so you don't have to write that out twice. But this actually does have two answers. And then 7 doesn't break down under a radical. There's no perfect square that goes into 7. So this would just be my solutions, but it's two answers if you introduce the square root into the problem. If the square root is already in the problem, which it's not here, but we'll do this later in the semester, or next semester, but if it's already in the problem, you do not put a plus and minus symbol. You, if, it's just if you're solving and you introduce the square root to solve. All right, so let's try the one next to this, kind of similar. I'm going to add 25. And I'd have 4x squared equals 25. What should I do next? If I have 4x squared equals 25. Okay, I'm so glad you said and that. Somebody said that to me last period too. Okay, this in this situation, you could take the square root because both the 4 and the 25 are perfect squares. And you maybe saw those on those lists. Here's what I want to please, please, please ask you to do. Don't take the square root until you get the x alone because this won't, whatever's in front of the x might not be a perfect square. So I would just do one tiny step first. Just get the x squared totally alone. Please, please, please. You're actually going to see this on the very next question. Um, get the x squared totally alone and then take the square root after you get that totally done. This case is a, is a perfect example where it's okay because you can take the square root of 4, but if you don't have a number in front of your x squared, your coefficient, if it's not a perfect square, you're going to end up working with a radical, and it's not always the nice situation. So when we introduce the square root, so do that first, and then put your plus and minus because you got two answers. Then what's the square root of 25? 5. And the square root of 4? So our answer is just a fraction. This, like I said, this particular question would have worked totally fine if you took the square root um, back in that step where we had 4x squared equals 25. But I just, I really don't want you to get in that habit. Let me show you. In this next question, like if I add 64 and you're looking at that and you're going, that's a perfect square. And it totally is. But if you took the square root of both sides here, you'd have to have plus or minus radical 2 and then divide that on both sides. So don't do that. I'm just trying to save you some time. Just get the x squared totally alone first. So just get that divide by 2, get rid of that coefficient. So when you have the x squared all alone, then that's when you want to take the square root, just to try to save a little bit of time. 
for this question, 32 is not a perfect square. So I still need the plus minus, but I want to break that down and write it in simplest radical form. Anybody know biggest perfect square goes in 32? 16. So 16 times 2. And we're just going to take square root of 16. That's just going to come out in front. So I'd have plus or minus 4 roots of 2. And again, this is two answers in one. It's just a little, that plus minus symbol is a little shorthand way to write it. If you were to graph this, this would be like what we were graphing yesterday, where we had some of the decimals that were not great. This would be a not great decimal if you did 4 times the square root of 2. So that scenario is kind of if we were to solve this on a graph, it would be a decimal on the x-axis. But it makes the equation true if you plug it back in. All right, now I've, each one of these down at the bottom is just a little tiny bit different than the ones we were doing above. Here, get your x squared by itself. I'm just going to subtract 9 to do that. And just like we were doing before, we take square root. Can we take the square root of a negative number? No, 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 no. Okay, so for today... Uh, I'm going to write no real solution here. If you actually tried to type this on your calculator, like square root of negative 9, it would give you an error message. There's no number that you can multiply by itself to create a negative number in the real number system. Like if I did 5 times 5, that's positive 25. If I did negative 5 times negative 5, it's also positive 25. There's no way to get a negative. I would need one number to be negative and one to be positive, and you can't multiply a number by itself and get a negative. It's just not possible. So no real solution. If we were to graph this like we were doing, this would be like, I'm just making this up, this would be at 9. The graph would be like this and it would never touch the x-axis. So visually, you would not see a real answer. We are going to talk about imaginary solutions. That's actually the next lesson we're going to talk about. So there is a way to break these down, but it's not something that's a real number, and it's not something you can visually see. So you might have a couple like that on the homework just to practice. Now, these last two, very similar. They don't look quadratic, actually, as they're presented, but these are each a proportion. So I have 8 over 5x equals x over 10. Anybody know how you would go about solving that equation? Yeah. Cross multiply. Perfect. So cross products are diagonal from each other. doesn't matter which one goes first or second. So I would have one of the cross products would be 8 times 10. That'll be 80. I'm just writing it out so you can see what I'm doing. The other cross product would be 5x times x. So you should have 80 equals 5x squared. So it does create a quadratic because one of the cross products has you multiply an x times x. So this is a quadratic equation. Again, don't take the square root until you get the x totally by itself. So divide by 5 first real quick. You'd have 16 is equal to x squared. This is actually very nice because it's a perfect square then plus or minus 4. So before or negative 4. If we graph that, that's the two places it would cross the x-axis at 4 and negative 4. And I got one more. This also creates a quadratic. So I'm going to do 6 times 14 and 7x times x. Those are your two cross products. You get 84 is equal to 7x squared. The x times the x creates the quadratic. So don't take the square root until you get the x squared alone. I'm going to divide by 7 real quick. You do get 12, so it's a nice number, is equal to x squared. And 12 is not a perfect square, though, so we want to see if we can break that down into simplest radical form. Anybody know biggest perfect square that will go into 12? Yeah, four. just 4. 4 times 3 has to be multiplication, and I forgot my plus minus symbol. But if you take the square root of 4, that's going to come out as a 2. The 3 stays under the square root. And again, you get two answers with that plus and minus symbol. Is anybody having a question? Okay, now when you flip to the back side, this is going to be the other scenario that I talked about where um, we're going to have a set of parentheses that's squared. You do not, do not, I mean you can, but you're going to create a lot more work from yourself, for yourself. Don't foil this out or put it in a box or multiply it and put it in standard form because it's just going to take you way longer to do the problem. If you see a set of parentheses squared like this, just treat that like a giant variable. We're going to get that by itself, and you want that. You do not 
you do not want to foil that. If you have that, perfect, because we can get rid of it by taking a square root. We just have to get it alone first. So first thing I need to do, get rid of any addition or subtraction. So get rid of that positive 6 first by subtracting it. We're just doing our order of operations backwards to undo these. This gives you 54 minus 6 is 48. Now, do not distribute anything into a set of parentheses that has an exponent. So no distributive property here. Don't distribute. You actually want to divide. You're going to try to get that little set of parentheses by itself. So I'm going to have x minus 2 squared. 48 divided by 3 is a nice number. It's 16. Now this is what you want. Don't FOIL because you can just cancel square root and squared cancel each other out. So it's like a big x squared. It just has a set of parentheses. What you do there, just literally drop the parentheses, drop the squared. It stays x minus 2. If that was a number, I could, you know, if I had a 4 or something, you don't take the square root of the number. It's just the square root and squared cancel each other out. So you should just copy down whatever's in the parentheses. Now, this is the tricky part to this question. This, we introduced the square root, so we have to put the plus and minus, and 16 is a perfect square. So the square root of that is 4, so you have plus or minus. This has an extra step the questions on the other side did not because now I have x minus 2. All you're going to do, you're just going to add 2 to the other side just real quick. And what I would tell you to do, just put it right after the equal sign. So I have 2 plus or minus 4. Now, both of these guys are numbers. I don't have any radicals here, so I can actually get my two answers. What you would do, you would... I just kind of write it to the side. So like 2 plus 4 is 6, and 2 minus 4 is negative 2. So my two answers there, it's not just plus and minus the same value in that situation because we had that set of parentheses. But if you can actually add them, two plain numbers, you can add 2 plus 4 is 6, 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Is anybody having a question? So if I'm doing the next problem... I've got 2 times, in parentheses, 4x plus 3 squared equals 128. What should I do first? As the very first step, what do we think? Okay, so what would you get? Perfect. What do you want to do next? There you go. All right. What am I going to get for my square root of 64? Good. All right. Now, this is a little more complicated than the previous question because I have a couple terms that were inside the parentheses. I'm going to do the same thing, though, just like you'd solve a normal equation. I'm going to subtract 3. When I do that, what I would tell you to do, I'm just going to put that right directly after the equal sign, so I have negative 3 plus or minus 8. Don't actually add or subtract that. I know we can, but don't do that at the moment. I'm going to get x totally alone first and then have you do it separately. So it'll be kind of a fraction as you go through here. So divide by 4. So you have negative 3 plus or minus 8 over 4. So I'm going to just do two things. I'm going to do negative 3 plus 8 divide by 4. You have to simplify the top of the fraction before you divide. Just negative 3 plus 8 is going to be 5 and then over 4, that doesn't divide or reduce. So that's just one of the answers, 5 fourths. The other answer, I would do negative 3 minus 8 divided by 4. Again, you got to simplify the numerator first. Get that down to one number. That would just be negative 11 here over 4. If you can reduce, go ahead. If you can divide, go ahead. Negative 11 and 4 don't have anything in common. They don't divide. So I'm just going to leave the answer as a fraction. If we were looking at a graph, those are the two places on the graph where it would cross the x-axis. So 5 over 4, which is 1.25, and negative 11 over 4, which would be what negative 2.75. And then I have one more, and then we're going to use the calculator for the last, the last question. I have this one. Again, I have a set of parentheses. Do not FOIL. Don't use a box. Don't multiply it out. Leave it in the parentheses. That's good for us. I have x plus 1 squared over 5. What would you do first for that last question? Multiply by 5. Yes. Okay, we're just going to multiply by 5. 
All it's going to do on the left side of that equation is just totally cancel out the fraction, but it will keep the x plus 1 squared. Now 9 times 5 is 45. Once you're there, we're just going to take a square root. We have to introduce the square root to solve the problem. Square root and squared cancel each other out. Just drop those parentheses. You get x plus 1. Now 45, I can break that down. It's not a perfect square, but I can break that down. What's the biggest perfect <coughs> square that will go into 45? 9. 9. All right, I guess I could, could have just left the 9 and 5 separate when I was doing that, just in that step above here. So the 9, when you take the square root of that, pulls out a 3. So then I have x plus 1 equals plus or minus 3 roots of 5. This is a little bit different even than the last two we just did. I still need to get x alone, so I'm going to move the positive 1 to the other side by subtracting it. The difference here, I cannot actually add that to 3 radical 5. It's just a, it's a, it's a radical, it would be like me saying, What's negative 1 plus 2x? You have to leave it as two separate terms. So that's how this works. Just negative 1 plus or minus 3 roots of 5. It's still two answers because of the plus or minus. It's just not something we can simplify any farther because I can't add a plain number to something that has a radical attached to it. They're not like terms. It would, if we saw this on a graph, it would be some kind of a nasty decimal where it crossed the x-axis. Is anybody having a question? Okay, now, here's the, my last scenario. So this is a little bit of a word problem. It does not have a linear term, though. So it's kind of more similar to the first example we did. This is the function h equals negative 16t squared plus 270 models, models. I can speak the height h in feet of an object t seconds. So it's height in feet, time in seconds, after it is dropped from the top of a building that's 270 feet tall. Now, you'll notice, and don't, don't write this on your paper, but when we were doing this formula before we had a middle term that had the velocity, if you just drop something it doesn't have a speed. If you throw something, though, you're putting speed behind it, which causes us to have a linear term. Because we're just dropping something, it doesn't have the linear term. So that's the difference there. All right, um, and forgive. This should say, after how many seconds will the object be 206 feet off the ground? I apparently can't type. So let me draw you a tiny, just a sketch of this, right? So as time passes, we're starting, the building is 270 feet tall, and we're going to just drop this object, and as time passes, gravity's going to pull it down to the ground. All right, so it says, after how many seconds will the object be 206 feet off the ground? If I'm starting at 270, somewhere on the way down, we're going to hit 206. So all it means is to plug in 206 for the height. That's all that means. So I'm just going to use the equation that they give me. And remember that negative 16 is the force of gravity in feet per second. Now, if I had said to you, when is this object going to hit 300 feet? You'll be like, Miss Brody, hello, the building was only 270 feet tall, so it would not hit 300 feet. But if I ask you to hit 206, we are going to hit 206 on the way down because that's less than 270. So all you have to do, we're just going to get the T by itself. So I would subtract the 270. If you do that, you're going to get a negative number, but that's okay. I'm going to get negative 64 equals negative 16 T squared because that force of gravity is negative 16. Now, when I divide both sides trying to get that T by itself, the negative divided by negative cancels out, and so I just get 4 equals my time squared. All right, now we're just going to take square root like we've been doing in all the other questions today. Do I want to put a plus and minus in front of my answer? Why not? You cannot have negative time. All right, so if you have a word problem, just be mindful of this, and it depends on the question. But in general, you're not going to put a plus or minus um, you can't have negative time, and that's what t represents here. You can't have a negative distance either.
So we can't have a negative time. So that's why I'm not going to put a plus and minus. This is a nice perfect square. The square root of 4 is 2. So t would be 2 seconds here for the object to hit the height of 206 feet. But it would only hit it on the way down. It would not hit it at another time because it's not, the, that full parabola would go on a negative time frame for our graph. So just the two. Don't put a plus and minus. And then I have one more question. And we're just, we're not going to leave this in radical form. I'm just going to have you um, round this if it's not a perfect square to the nearest hundredth of a second. It says, after how many seconds will the object hit the ground? So there's, there's where it would be on the graph, right? What is your height if you're on the ground? Zero. Because it's your height above the ground. So if you're on the ground, your height is zero. This comes up in questions all the time. So if it's saying, where, you know, how long is it going to take the object to hit the ground? It's trying to tell you to plug in zero for the height. So this, whatever this is, it would be time comma zero when the object comes back down to the ground. So all I'm going to do, just use that equation they gave us above, just put in zero for the height. So we'd have negative 16 t squared plus 270, very similar to what we just did. I'm just going to subtract the 270 from 0, so that's going to be negative 270. Now, again, in this scenario, the two negatives, when you divide both sides by negative 16, the negatives are going to cancel out. If I do this on my calculator, I usually just take and just drop the negatives off, but if you do, sorry, there's a glare, 270 divided by 16. This is not a nice number. And I'm not going to ask you to put some decimal in radical form. That's not going to happen. So we would have 16.875 equals our time squared. Again, like the last question, we're not going to put a plus and minus because a minus would represent negative time. But we're just going to use the calculator. So if you guys don't know this, I had, I actually, I didn't tell the last class and then I had a bunch of people ask me. There is a square root button if you haven't used it before because we haven't done much with radicals this year. You just hit second and then it's the button that's diagonal from the seven that has the x squared. The second function on that will give you a square root. Then you can just type in that 16.875 and it's going to ask you in the directions to go to the nearest hundredth, which is two decimal places. So I would say this would be about I'm kind of rounding this here because it's got a longer decimal, about 4.12 seconds for the object to come back down to the ground. So that square root button, just it's, kind of, it's on the left-hand side, a little bit farther than halfway down. You have to hit second and then the x squared button, and that should be your square root if you're using the graphing calculator. All right, does anybody have a question? I'm going to let you guys, the homework is super, super similar to the notes.